very interesting uh, and challenging uh, things. What I gather from this uh, is that uh, perhaps uh, one uh, additional falling, uh, you know, or problem uh, is that uh, democracy has been intended, uh, for example, U.S. Uh, Constitution, uh, as a continuous uh, process and product. If there is not a continuous process, uh, there is not uh, a truly democratic product. And uh, we all know how many problematic, <laughs> even the election, uh, you know, how different there is uh, allotted the representativity to each state. But if it's so, Democracy is supposed uh, to have a check and balance. Uh, so democracy is not uh, a Polaroid. Click, smile, you are democratic, uh, you are certified. Uh, democracy ISO 9000. <laughs> That's not democracy. It's a mummy of democracy. And so I would uh, wonder if uh, one of the failing or problem uh, and at the opposite of virtue of an effective democracy is to have a continuous process, which means a democracy is in process, and the process is the experience, learning from the experience. A lot of us have said today, what well, it doesn't work. But the what that doesn't work uh, is not the problem. Nothing works in life. When you drive, uh, you don't expect it to go straight. You are, if you are a good driver, continually adjusting. So I think uh, when you freeze uh, democracy and when you freeze uh, the you know, steering, continuous steering and adjusting, and uh, you know, there are problems uh, that uh, you cannot phantom today. So you have to continue to adjust. The moment that uh, you froze democracy, the moment that uh, you froze uh, the expectation, because I'm born and I have uh, unlimited rights, including, uh, in my opinion, for what uh, Neborsha was saying, well, that's a, a very high expectation. I'm one. Uh, and uh, you are a million, if it's not uh, also my wish uh, granted, uh, I would call uh, you undemocratic. It seems uh, quite unrealistic. Uh, democracy is to manage reality, not to manage uh, delusion. Uh, and so I would say that uh, anything that is not continuously an aware process, like any healthy individual, healthy individual is uh, supposed to learn from mistake. If he doesn't, he uh, is affected by psychopathology. And what is a psychopathology? Too much rigidity because you're frozen uh, in a defense mechanism of fear. So I'm not uh, painting a, a pink uh, a picture here, but uh, wondering uh, if uh, there is a lot of, of misunderstanding what is uh, democracy. And if it's not a process, uh, I don't think you're going to get uh, ever a <coughs> democratic product. You know, anytime you freeze, uh, you kill it. I think one of the most important problem is credibility problem. What I mean by this, uh, what politicians say and how they behave, there, there are some uh, inconsistencies. We are observing lots of corruption, nepotism, bribery, so they always commit to improve democratic rights, but we observe just the opposite of this. This is the first and for me the most, that's why we lost the confidence or credibility of democracy perhaps. And the second one is um, at uh, national level, we could be democratic, but when it comes to international governments, uh, many countries, they are not democratic. The, I think most important example is the United Nations, because only five countries, almost out of 180, perhaps 200, including some island states, uh, only have uh, rights to veto some decisions, so which is unfair. This means that I am 
richer than you, so I will have more worse than you. So this also uh, causes some loss or belief in, in democracy. I think this is another one. And um, uh, one more, in our national uh, education systems, Yes, of course, we need to keep our cultural uh, roots and origins, which is very important and our richness. But we always teach that we are different than others. UNESCO once uh, had a program, I don't know whether still they keep following this, but in how many countries in primary schools they teach, this is called LTLT, learning to live together, tolerance against others. Perhaps we need to perhaps determine uh, our common shared principles, how we can do this, like Greek city states, we have information technologies now, perhaps it could be taken by you as an utopic idea, but like appointing an international ombudsman, we can choose it, and then if we can provide cyber security, then uh, many decisions can be taken with the majority votes of uh, global citizens, not national citizens, but you know, Utopia is nice. Utopia, I, if I'm not wrong, is a Greek word for no place, but we can use Utopia, good place. We can, we can move, because we want to be a change maker, right? So once the head of Royal uh, Science Academy said, nothing heavier than air can fly, but we are flying with airplanes, so it is good to be utopic sometimes, so we can do this. Uh, or we need to think about governance without governments at international level. There are lots of studies on this. I, this is not an expression created by me. Governance without governments at international level. So uh, I think that's all. And culture, uh, culture <laughs> is difficult to, to define. There are different definitions, but the beliefs, values, ideas that we are inheriting from our ancestors. So we carry these cultures. It is, it is very difficult. We can teach new things to our students, but it is almost impossible to, to, to forget the things that were told to us before. So it takes longer time, but we can create a common culture at least for international governments, because the world is going to a wrong direction, uh, how we can uh, put it to a right road again. So uh, I think instead of underlying our improvements in our economic indicators, we can concentrate on our social indicators, the alienation of everything, loss of flexibility, loss of anxiety, modernism brought lots of problems. We go to psychologists very often. So there are some advantages and disadvantages of uh, achieving high per capita income. So anyway, for now, that much is enough. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you so much. If, if I may just say a, a, a few lines for uh, students uh, and for everybody else interested, uh, because you triggered uh, many, many things there. I, I recommend to you to read, uh, if you've already done, uh, um, uh, papers from uh, Elinor Ostrom that was uh, mm -hmm. just a uh, uh, mm -hmm. Nobel Prize, 2009 Nobel Prize mm -hmm. uh, in economics. And, uh, and then in specific, this article that you can download from, uh, from internet is Beyond Markets and States, Polycentric Governance and Complex Economic Systems. Mm -hmm. And then I recommend you to read even the air book that was Governing the Commons. And then, uh, and then uh, so you can start thinking, so what's the democracy w uh, good for? Mm -hmm. uh, why we, uh, which, which are the, adva we, the advantages to use democracies, a third democracy, and not authoritarianism? If we, if we, if we, if we find a more reason to get a, a democratic approach, then you found your answers. You know, our discussion uh, has toyed with the interrelationship of democracy and power. But we haven't really come to grips with the problem of power, in my view. And, and uh, so we, we can have some explanation of power by looking much more um, uh, contextually at the institutions specialized to power, which then impact on what we mean by democracy or how democracy works. But there's another aspect of power that is 
indirectly related to power, and it only emerges when we contextualize the problem of power. And when we contextualize that, we find that a whole range of values implicated in democracy that indirectly implicate the problem of power and affect the way we approach the question of democracy. I'll give you a few examples. For example, uh, our colleague talked about neoliberalism and the demise of democracy and so on. Well, wealth is a base of power. It's not power directly, but if you don't have any dough, you can't run an election, you know? And so wealth has an immense uh, impact, as our neoliberal friend pointed out, on the scope and nature of how power is shaped and shared, all right? Uh, then we have uh, the notion of uh, the value of respect, social class status. That in itself is a base of power which determines whether we win elections or don't win elections or stand or whatever. Uh, then there's the question of skill. You've got no skill, you don't go anywhere. So skill is an important base of power, all right? Uh, affection and compassion are bases of power. Yeah, we can't function without love and compassion and so on. That is an important base of power. People who love you or love you, uh, uh, you will have an effect on the way in which power uh, evolves or reflects democratic principles. Mm. Health and well-being, if you're sick as a dog, you're not worth anything. So you, you need some element of health and well-being as a base of power. Uh, rectitude, well, it's uh, religious values and, and the like, but, but those are very important historical issues which sustain uh, the question of power. Power is shaped, shared, and used wisely. Okay? Uh, I haven't gone through all the values yet, but all of these values are actually a component of the International Bill of Rights. They are there. We don't have to search for them. They are there. But what they do is they contextualize power in, in a much more meaningful way, permitting us to bring into the focus of our democratic attention those institutions which work per perfectly or imperfectly to maximize the shaping and the sharing of power essential to a democracy. For me, um, a good way of looking at um, this issue of failings is to, to, to understand a bit the, the way this world system has evolved since uh, three, three, 300 years or 400 years ago, right? Because the way uh, nations, in, it was basically European nations, got hold of the world uh, was not democratic. There, was no, there were no democracies at the time. Mm -hmm. There was primitive accumulation of capital. Then in the 19th century, we got capitalism as a whole with industrialization and so on. <coughs> and democracy appeared, appeared as, in fact, uh, the question of the expression of the principles of the will of people, really, after the First World War. Yes after the First World War, when you had to oppose democratic countries and socialist countries. There were socialist, communist countries, there was the revolution, mm -hmm. and in fact, those forces, mm -hmm. which are beyond uh, uh, nations and so on, you know, I mean, I'm referring to financial power, mm -hmm. basically, uh, they, they sort of, you know, uh, got, they, they bet on uh, democratic uh, countries, the West, uh, in order to continue their possibility of accumulation. There was a tremendous crisis in the 1930s, but we had a war. And after the war, the Second World War, the United States emerged as a leader of the free world. Right? So this is the period of democracies. Now the issue now is the following, I think is, I mean, the issue of Trump. It's the first time I talk about Trump. I, I think it's not really very much, uh, for me, it's not, I, I, I don't like the guy, right? Not like most of you. You don't? No. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, 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 look, I, I, look at, I look at Trump as, uh, as a, uh, a signal, as, as a, um, a pointer of the decline of American hegemony. Mm -hmm. you know? The issue is, um, who will, in fact, uh, be able to continue the possibility of accumulating financial capital as, at, at, at the moment? 
Is it China? Maybe, maybe, maybe not, we don't know. Uh, and if, for instance, but if China is able to maintain these, uh, what is the multipolar on it? What was polycentric. It? Polycentric. Polycentric. This polycentric way, uh, which means deregulation at large, right? Because uh, a unicentric country can somehow exert some 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 measure of contention. Deregulation. Hmm? Yeah, deregulation for the others. It means perhaps a dispersed regulation. Yeah. So this unregulation, yeah, completely. Um, um, so if China is able to maintain this for you know 50 more years or something, I'm sure that uh, probably uh, it will be in their interest to. Uh, to do this. And, and democracy, what is the interest of financial capital in democracy? None. Understood. Financial capital and their, the networks of financial capital are by essence anti-democratic. Right? So as long as the situation, the geopolitical situation is such that it and allows uh, accumulation to, to this extent, we won't have any help from them. So, what I mean by this is that um, one of the, the issues that we have really to, to confront is, you know, really, what is this world that we are making here? Yes. The failing. Uh, this is, will be a, an unknown failing of democracy. But in fact, <coughs> democracy is an historical product, really, as, as we said this morning, right? Already, uh, it, it originated. Our representative democracy. Yeah. I mean, it originated and it probably will have some evolution. But people who are waiting about the, 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 the breakdown of, of capitalist uh, societies and so on, they have been waiting all the time because capitalism has been able to restructure itself and bring new forms. And now it is in a form that we, we think that is suicidal, mm -hmm. right? Because they don't tend to. Uh, look at global commons because uh, you know precariat all the time. I mean, we look at this and we see well, all this <coughs> rest will be a revolution. But how? I mean, uh, with what what power? You know, who controls? Uh, you know, military and uh, so. I think that this, this issue of, of failing of, of democracy has also to be seen uh, outside uh, each nation and each uh, particular particular. Uh, possibility of failure through elections, through uh, referenda, through uh, you know dictatorship and things like that. Yeah. First, a confession. <coughs> you know, I uh, must confess that I'm now much yeah. more confused than at the beginning. <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 Because uh, we started with uh, the unclarity of the definition of what. And now we continue using democracy in all possible and impossible ways. And that's indeed confusing. I must say that uh, it's clear for everybody that democracy is in crisis, in a bad situation. Uh, the question, how bad and what exactly is bad? I see that many people here are talking about the economic problems and that economic problems made the situation bad. Uh, I belong to a different breed. I see uh, the problem in the cultural sphere. Because uh, um, uh, it is r much deeper than the economic problems, in my judgment. Because one of the problems of the democracy that it has been turned into an instrument of economic optimization. When you look at the agenda of any parliament in the world, 80% of the decisions are on economic governance. And people disagree with that. They want to have a word and their opinion on more underlying principle uh, issues of their life, not only uh, uh, what kind of economy uh, we will have. Uh, therefore, democracy is not an ethical principle and is not a system of governance. It is, uh, let me say, a political regime. System of governance could be different. It could be a monarchy, it could be a republic, whatever. 
but monarchy could be democratic, mm -hmm. like Nordic countries, like United Kingdom, and uh, there are many such countries in the world, or undemocratic. It's a political vision. And for me, what's also important that, <clears throat> uh, aside from turning the democracy, like we call it liberal democracy, which is limited to election, uh, and the uh, change of uh, the power uh, in the top, regular change of the power. It, it is now nothing more than uh, the road shows, which are take, taking place every four or six or whatever years. There is nothing behind that. If Pirico or a person from that time could have come to our society, he would be surprised that we called it a democracy, because he despised democracy. He didn't like democracy, as Aristotle, as Plato, as all of them. They did not, they criticized the democracy. And what he would call that, what we have? He would call it, how? Plutocracy. He would call, uh, yeah, oligarchy, oligarchy aristocracy, oligarchy. democracy, plutocracy, whatever. But not the democracy, why? Because the original substance, power of the people, there is no power in, uh, to other people. During, you know, if for 60 years uh, the society <coughs> functions on the basis of um, uh, prioritizing meritocracy, if it is functions on the basis of prioritizing the ideas of competitiveness and success, why we are surprised that the end, at the end of that period we have highly segmented, <coughs> atomized society that lost all the trust in the democratic institutions. And last, uh, and last, I'm not saying that everything that bad. Because in fact, even if it is not power of the people, democracy is still very valuable instrument. And the most valuable thing that functions in normal economies is, it could be also, uh, you know, um, uh, implied by a sort of slogan, power to no one meaning that there is no single person, entity, party, institution that can consolidate and uh, uh, use this power uh, contrary to <coughs> the logic of separation of power. And that is, in my judgment, the biggest achievement of the democracy which we have. Okay, so. And, uh, the first, I would like more if the title of this session was instead of failing successes, since I think there are fewer successes than failures. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, even in that case, it would be very difficult to quote successes. This is a rather vague, vague issue. But let me come back to the introduce of this session. Mm -hmm. We are talking mostly on democratic governance. I really don't know what's the democratic governance. Is it at all possible? Yes. It's not difficult to agree that we might have democratic elections. Big question. Are those elections democratic? They are democratic according to the people. And my right to vote but to finish the election procedure, even in states we know that they are not democratic. So that's a big issue. Can uh, democracy be governed democratically? Uh, to govern, to, to have uh, governance, you only recognize power and interest, and they are often against democracy. So it's very difficult to understand what you meant when you, you were quoting all the time democratic governance. What is democratic governance? It was an go 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 government doesn't recognize democracy. By, by definition, 
It is power and defense, and they are often con con contradictory to the democracy. Thank you. Of course, we already had a session on the achievements of democracy, which also includes the successes, I hope. Uh, that's what we meant. But we did, one point was missed in that section, and that is that one of the things democracy does very well is it releases the energy of the people. And it, more than any other society, form of society, it releases the energy of people for initiative which may be used for different purposes. Uh, and that's why the Toad Bill, when he came to America, commented on the extraordinary energy that he found there, which he'd never seen uh, anywhere else. And when, uh, uh, when Paul Johnson was writing about the history, uh, an English historian was writing about the history of 19th century America, he was astounded by the amount of energy, social energy that had been released. That's on the positive side. The things I want to talk about, the failings, uh, I mean, are, are so fundamentally <coughs> obvious that they shouldn't need to be raised at all. But it raises a question as to how democracy has ever been of any utility. Uh, and that's why I wanted to bring them out. Uh, the first one is that we are, uh, this is a system in which individuals are making choices according to their own predilection. And there are two fundamental, or three fundamental problems with that. One is we're ignorant, uh, and a system based on ignorance is bound to have failings, even if with the best of intentions. Uh, secondly, we're irrational, which is different from being ignorant, uh, because we want things that we can't have, or we want to have things for ourselves, but not for other people uh, at the same time. Uh, and a fundamental thing which has always existed, I'm, I'm saying something so obvious, but yet when you see it ag uh, exaggerated, it becomes, we've always had voting done on this basis of irrationality and ignorance. But there was, in the past, often a certain degree of a sense that we're choosing something that should be good for everyone. Uh, and uh, yet more and more, uh, we've got consciously uh, our, our system working in a way is we're going to choose what's good for us, what we believe in, even if nobody else does. And in the recent American elections, it got exaggerated to such a point that the president didn't even claim when he came to power that I represent all the people. <laughs> he didn't even make, I mean, all the presidents said they represented all the people. He's even dropped that facade. I represent the people who voted for me, even if they are a minority, by the way, uh, but I got to power and now we're gonna cash in and do what they want and I'm gonna ignore what everybody else wants. So, of course, that's always been there as an undercurrent, but it makes you wonder, how did this system ever work? Or make us look at conditions in which it worked better at some times than other times, in some places than other places, because these characteristics are not the characteristics of a few human beings. This is human nature. So if we really look at where it has worked better, or when it has worked better, for example, uh, uh, I saw, I mean, if you look at American history and Indian history, those are the ones I know the best. Uh, at the time that they were fighting for independence, or in the very earliest days, uh, the systems were, worked better in the sense that there was a cohesion of, uh, there was a shared vision and a willingness to work for a common goal where there was something shared of course, always limited. Uh, there was a sense of idealism in the leaders uh, that was very marked, if you see, at the time, the birth of the US and the birth of India. We had great idealistic leaders who sacrificed their, their careers and, and, and their lives to, uh, for independence. I'm talking in India, particularly. Uh, and yet, afterwards, you get a different type of leader uh, 
uh, coming in. So my first comment was, as I say, very obvious, and that is a, a fundamental question as what, on what basis is the electorate choosing their leaders? Are I, am I voting for somebody who's going to do what I want, or am I voting for somebody who's going to do what's good for the country? What's good for everybody, or what's good for the country? Uh, and now we don't even have that facade that uh, we're voting for somebody who's going to do what's good for everybody, we're going to vote. So how can there not be a fundamental failing in this system? It's a wonder that it doesn't always work uh, as exaggerated as it is today. The other one, and equally obvious, I'm not saying anything profound, I'm saying something very obvious, but still I think it's worth saying, and that is uh, the people who are governing. There have been, in, in the past, I mean, even in, uh, uh, in many countries, there was the idea that those who are going into politics are public servants who are going to serve the public interest uh, uh, with a certain amount of self-sacrifice. I mean, the original members of parliament in England uh, weren't even paid. Uh, they were uh, sacrificing themselves to do something that was supposed to be good obviously with their own skewed uh, perception. Uh, now we've got people running as career politicians whose primary objective is to get elected the next time. Uh, and of course that brings in the issue of money because you need, which everybody's been mentioning, you need a lot of money uh, to get reelected in the way uh, most of these systems work today. So the, the, the self-interest of the politician is not to reflect the will of the people or even do what's best for the country, but too much he's looking at his own career. How could we ever expect, have expected a system uh, to work without major flaws uh, under those circumstances? Now we see it exaggerated, it, it looks exaggerated to me, uh, by the fact that Politicians have always told the people what they wanted to hear. That's nothing new. But uh, we see an exaggerated level, tell them anything they'll swallow for the moment, uh, even if uh, it's blatantly, patently false. And that goes back to the first point, because what's been, what puzzled the, the media during uh, uh, Reagan's uh, first term in office was, what they're doing with Trump now, what the Washington Post and New York Times are doing with Trump now, they did with Reagan uh, uh, in the early 80s too. They categorized every lie uh, or misfact that he quoted and thought it was their duty to put it up uh, and put it before the public. And, yet, and then the Washington Post, after a couple of years, they published an editorial and say, we're totally baffled because for two years we thought we were doing our duty of pointing out as objectively, impersonally as we could the facts and the, the gap between what the president is telling us and what uh, the facts are, and yet his popularity keeps going up. So that goes back to the first point. Can we have a system, how do we deal with a system where people want to believe what's good for them want to believe that somebody else is responsible for their problems and never we're responsible, uh, want to look for a scapegoat. Uh, uh, it's amazing that the system has worked uh, as, as well as it has. Bad news it has. Hmm? Bad news it has. Uh, either way. I have just a short remarks uh, of concerns the parliament, the decision body, the transmission between the voters and the decision body and the voters. So, uh, by experience, everybody of us know that many votes are just votes because voters don't know what they should choose. Uh, we have uh, in Europe many uh, elections uh, where people say, I had no choice. There are two candidates, no none of them is uh, desired. So, but I, I vote because the other one is even worse. Yeah. 
So it's not to a vote, uh, it's not a decision. So the second point is the media play a very important role uh, concerning the decisions or also the consciousness of the voter, uh, uh, of the voters. So we have very diverse influences on the decision of the voters. The second point is uh, the transfer mechanism to the uh, parliament in this case or local parliaments and so on. So many uh, uh, influences exist uh, uh, if there are legitimate and legal interests or only legitimate interests. Uh, voters, if you have, for example, uh, in many cases for local parliaments, mm -hmm. you have uh, legitimate interests, but they may be not legal because they are not in the codices of the uh, uh, legal system and therefore you, you cannot approach the, the decision body because uh, it is not legal to ask for something. So one has to define uh, what is legal, what is legitimate and this concerns the NGOs. What role the NGOs can have uh, and uh, if they are not going directly the legal system. And finally, uh, the parliament, <coughs> I agree fully, many parliamentarians are sub subject to lobbies, uh, to very uh, narrow economic interests, and uh, uh, fake news and things like this. And there's a discussion in the, uh, <coughs> in the, uh, within the new media that uh, the population should have a consultancy function in the parliament, local parliaments and uh, national parliaments. So they should have a right to be uh, in a hearing. Normally we have hearings prescribed by, by the government or, and uh, informal groups have not the right to be heard in the parliament. You know, uh, hearings, open hearings uh, are normally uh, very restricted and I think this should be much more open what concerns the parliament itself. So. Voters, transmission, and parliament, they should be much more open <coughs> to think about. For example, uh, one can think that the uh, parliamentarians uh, have their salary depending on the successes they have in their uh, uh, region. There's a, a discussion in the European Union that the, the salaries of the European Union uh, the parliamentarians should be linked to the success to implement certain, uh, certain projects in their uh, 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 district. So the other one is to have a limited time and uh, for rotation, you know, not five years, but they have to change about after two years then they can be re-elected just once and things like this. There are many things in, in the discussion and I think this should be investi investigated much more in view of sender uh, and uh, you know, voter transmission and parliament itself. Let us stop with the possible exceptions of Switzerland, Norway, Denmark and Finland calling the current systems in any remote sense democratic. Let's decide to do that, first of all, especially in regard to your, your comment about, um, uh, about the present system being democratic. Uh, and, and I think that we have now to examine, stay with the mud, the mud and mire of democratic failings for a little longer until we get thoroughly sick of it,
and then turn our minds to what we think democracy should and can be, because you'll not get it from history or the present situation. It is. Apart from the four countries I've mentioned, possibly one or two others, the systems are not democratic, if you understand democratic in any reasonable definition. Okay, thank you. Oh, just one other point with regard to Mr. Tsukoni's suggestion. Uh, the parallel between individual hyperactivity and stasis was um, taken over to, scaled up to democracy. Democracy, of course, is a continuing and ongoing process, or rather must be, but um, we have to have some stable elements within it, and that I think we're going to learn is the function of the Constitution or the common statement of purpose, and certain matters must not be political footballs because they're matters of implementation. I refer you here to Ed Straw's book, Stand and Deliver, He's given recipes for vo avoiding what he calls zigzag governments, okay? Mm -hmm. Zigzag government. Um, not everything <coughs> needs to be made a political football. Not everything is subject to democratic <coughs> deliberation and decision. But certain things are, and I think we have a very, we have a very, um, a very vague, diffuse notion of the two, um, elements, essential ingredients of democracy I hope to be able to talk about, on the one hand, participation, and on the other hand, representation. That's what we need to be looking at, I think. Thank you. Can they use the right to answer? May I use the right to answer? Very short. Yes. Just a short one, because uh, is waiting for Go ahead. Well, okay. well, actually, just a few words. We are talking about democracy as a process, clearly. And there is no ideal democracy. If there is no democracy at all in the world, I do not understand what we are doing here. Well, I said there are four countries where democracy definitely does. No, 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 no. I said that even under modern and that's in Nordic countries we have, in many Nordic countries, and in the UK, we have democratic uh, political regime. That's what I said. In the UK? Yes. Oh, you exactly. <laughs> great topic that we took uh, the future of democracy since uh, more and more popular term coined by uh, Larry Diamond uh, that we are facing uh, serious democratic recession. Oh, yeah. So I think uh, we are up. But uh, even we observe this uh, recession in this room, you know, we don't have enough access to take the floor. Those who are sitting you know, closer to the chairman, they have twice or three times more chances to speak out that we hear. Bobby uh, tried six times to take the floor, you know. I mean, see, even in, in, in such small, uh, you know, gathering, small room, you know, we have problems with democracy. So, what about nations, you know, one, two, three, and so on. Anyway, uh, when we look, uh, uh, I, I missed the discussion. I, I, uh, on the foundation, but somehow when we are talking about the democratic process, we should not be so confident that we invented this. This is maybe built in uh, in evolution, because I if you see, I mean, I I used to work as a pra pra I mean, inter and the BGP, the intelligent officers, bees who are coming from different direction, they convince, you know, the, the queen where to go, where to she present the troops to collect. And the, the more are, you know, convincing. So the majority, simply majority work. Even the process of our brain, the, the neutrons are coming with different uh, uh, information. The majority, 
uh, helps us to decide. So, you know, maybe a re we reinvented, maybe this is built in into evolution, think about that. Uh, and from that point of view, maybe we could be more optimistic uh, that finally democracy prevails in order to save uh, the, future, the human uh, being on the planet. As an economist, you know, I'm happy that we are here at this, uh, with Eric because there are many critical uh, comments about economists and uh, to some extent there are right, you know, but uh, uh, I, I should tell you that uh, there are many schools, not only neoliberal, uh, neoclassical uh, economists, but also there is a powerful institutional economist, and, and Keynesian, and uh, behavioral, and so on. This is not the issue. The issue is that in economics, I mean, uh, we developed, I mean, institutional, some sustainability criteria for institutions and the, 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 the process and the democratic governance. I mean, these are the institutions. And then uh, why the institu democratic institutions are failing? If I will use very simple uh, three criteria of institutional su sustainability after my good friend, I mean, because you now also know, uh, knew him, uh, Leo Hurwicz, he said, first, Incentives. If we have poor incentives, we do not support democratic institutions. You know, there is the way to uh, the democracy is very uh, time-consuming process. If, if the uh, the way to cut the process, if we don't have transparency, if we don't have that type of check and balances, I mean, people are cutting by corruption. You know, I mean, what we see in the US, you know, we cannot do research on the gun violence because of National Rifle Association buying the votes in the US Congress, period. That's so simple. So if people do not have incentives, they are cutting the, the rules, you know, trying to do violence. So incentives, uh, I mean, the, 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 the second, efficiency. How much time we invest in building democracy, maintaining democracy. We, unfortunately, we like uh, often, in the particular in the terms of public or collective, to, to take the free ride and behavior. Instead of investing we, investing, we want to take advantage of the, the final product. And democracy is very uh, time-consuming process. I, I like the, the, the uh, writing of uh, 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 Michael uh, Murray, you know, the, the Declaration of Proposal Independent Constitution, Constitutionalist. <laughs> Explaining what is the difference between parliamentary democracy and uh, and uh, the participatory democracy, you know how difficult it is. You we, you need to be involved. You need to invest your time all the time, not only elect but monitor and check your representatives. So the efficiency is very important. If uh, there are some other uh, uh, options, people choose to take the other options. And the, the, the last, subsidiarity. We observe a lot of governmental institutions centralized. Centralizing power is, and unfortunately, I mean, we need to build, you know, democracy from bottom up. And then, it's time consuming. It, uh, you know, but, you know, this is the only way, because we are meeting consensus, and then, uh, we are getting the right decision then, based on facts. And the last moment, you know, uh, in this uh, element with the institutions, I mean, there are a rule set by people. So the human capital is very critical. How we educate? If we do not introduce the real life processes, at early, early stage, in kindergarten and uh, school, and uh, getting 
young people involved in decision making democratic process. There will be not uh, conscious citizens in participatory democracy, period. We need to start very early uh, this process, investing in human capital. Because as, as my friend Alberto said, democracy is the process which helps you to grow up. And this is why we should focus on, on this uh, element. And uh, I see this uh, so my essay, you know, how the so-called the form of education is making harm you you pay you are getting some better results of the short previous government of uh, the, the, this party uh, with wave of no conservatives or populism or young voters. Now we might go back. So this is an example, you know, uh, that uh, it's not enough to talk about institutions. We need to talk about human capital and social capital because this is what is uh, uh, where, where where are the strong institutions? The strong institutions are there when the social capital is rich, when people invest it a lot of time. They know each other, they trust each other, and then they can build the institution. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, my, I would like to mention one more weakness of democracy, which is, uh, especially at international level, uh, I don't want to be misunderstood, you could be angry at me, but do we need to make all countries democratic by undemocratic waves. We wanted to make <laughs> Iraq and Libya more democratic. We destroyed these countries. So this is related with their culture, and we couldn't expect their leaders to behave uh, like the leaders of, although Michael said, uh, North European countries are not very um, ideal democracies, but <coughs> let's say relatively better than others. But we couldn't expect their leaders to behave like North European leaders. Like this is related with sure, their sure. leaders. So we need to find better and democratic and peaceful ways of integrating these undemocratic countries to our world order. Uh, actually, we, we this is related with trust because they know they understood now that the members of this rich countries club uh, they are running after their own interests rather than to democratize these societies because uh, many examples prove that the main aim is not to bring democracy to these countries. So we totally destroyed them. There were some dictators, but at least they were living peacefully with their neighbors for more than 50 years, 100 years. Yep. Now yep. they are killing uh, their 50 years long neighbors. We destroyed them totally. So do we need to make everyone democratic by using undemocratic ways? This is another question. We cannot even if we want to. Prove it. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, is your Yes. Well, listening to all this, I think we are all afraid of the future. Um, I agree that uh, the future doesn't uh, seem very bright at the moment. Uh, Maybe proposing unpleasant choices, and this is a danger. Um, uh, but I mean, what is the problem of democracy uh, being transformed? Uh, after all, there is no longer communism here. We have autocracies, right? Autocracy, everything. But you know, uh, the big, uh, the big evil that we have, uh, we, we we don't have. So. Um, and also, um, uh, the reason why Gary said, uh, said something very important, when, when India and the United States were uh, in the process of uh, acquiring uh, independence, uh, people were very cohesive. Uh, and this is a question of identity. And identity is not only based on culture. It's based on culture, of course, but also on patrimony. Patrimony is very important because it's a question of the places, the, the, the sites, and so on. But there is a certain very important aspect, which is the idea of the future. 
idea of the future, the project. Without, without an idea of the future, there is no identity. And what, what we are in fact experiencing is a lack of a project. Not only in Europe, but in the United States. Going back is not a project. Because time doesn't go back, we know that. Right? So, uh, what, what we can do, I mean, what many people in, uh, you know, people like us and other groups must do is try really to engage, uh, you know, seriously in uh, something that can move and can stimulate others to, to get a project for the future like we have and which at the moment seems uh, lost, but uh, we can have maybe not, not the one that was before, but a new one. I think that's, that, that can mobilize people and answers <coughs> and so on, but not you know, the, the, the present situation, which maybe is very convenient to some, to some group. Yes. Right? That, that's why, you know, uh, uh, because they, they, they exploit the situation to their advantage, right? Whoever. Mm -hmm. But it, this is in fact what we need. We resist to think and to act. Thank you. Um, uh, I just want to raise the question and see if there is any concern about what I will bring up. Uh, it was just uh, mentioned in the comment there about uh, gun violence in the United States. But um, is there room for discussion in the discussion of democracy as we are doing it? Is there room for bringing up the gun ownership which is protected by constitution, by the National Rifle Association, and by the large segment of the population itself, which is three levels of corporate uh, democratic government and the people, a uh, large segment of the population, uh, support the ownership, the, the um, I think, uh, irrational ownership of guns in the United States. You go into a house and you find in the shower area, a shower that is not used, 15 or 16 guns by an ordinary person who is just a dentist. And you, uh, uh, what is that about? And uh, of course, it's related to violence. And so is there room for democracy, particularly when comments like, uh, sh should we insist on democracy uh, uh, to be um, imposed on non-democratic um, countries? I don't think that, uh, I don't accept the pretense that it is democracy that's being exported. It's just stealing resources, that's all in this country. Yeah, uh, I agree. I agree positive. <laughs> 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 no, I think it's getting worse. No, I think it's getting worse. Because uh, last year I was in Dubrovnik. We were sitting on the last last floor. Nobody gave us a word. So we were trying to speak up, but no one. So today I'm speaking and she said, it of course I'm sorry, but it's just my, my, my idea to prove. So it's really discussion is bigger. Second uh, video, right? Yeah. What, uh, my friend started the discussion. Uh, I, uh, two weeks ago, friends of mine asked me, could you please advise our son? Because he is looking for the way how to educate himself. He's 15 years old and we have been friends for the last five years. I haven't seen him for for a year at least. So I am coming to their house, then the guy I want. He's coming and first question he's asking me. And he's coming from some school school event about democracy, diplomacy, and he said, Okay, so what would be what would be on the in the future, what would be the United Nations? What would what would be instead? And he's 15 years old. <laughs> so he's already thinking <laughs> thinking what to do with this world. So I agree with you that we should give them quality education for uh, platform for your use, uh, yeah. guys. How you said learning uh, how how to learn to learn to learn again. So I think we should we should be really very creative, very open-minded, 
and as open as, as possible to the open discussion with, with young people. Because sometimes they, they know better. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Yes, we, we, we jump into another question that I just want to follow up with. The, the question that you put up was essentially um, the process we used to get rid of Gaddafi and some of the others. Uh, your, first yeah, your first problem here is that the thugs who run these places radically don't want to leave. Okay? And if they leave, they're basically being forced out. And if you have to negotiate the business of forcing them out, you then get into a whole new arena, transformational justice. And this is highly controversial because essentially the thugs who you want to get out want immunity from accountability. If you give them immunity from accountability, you're giving them immunity from war crimes and crimes against humanity, which are international crimes, not sovereign crimes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, and we haven't really tested this question of whether the sovereign can transcend international law in order to get rid of a thug. Okay? It's not fully worked out. Uh, and in any event, these uh, uh, issues of transformational justice are, are, are very messy and incomplete. Uh, Argentinian thugs uh, did not want uh, a historical record of what they did. Uh, uh, the, and they wanted to close down, you've got a, a month or two and then it's over, you know? And, and so this problem of uh, letting the thugs go free, because there's not, you're not quite sure what you're doing. Although the trade-off you think is good, well, we get a bit of democracy even though we leave the thugs alone and, and the thugs retire in you know, happiness and wealth and so forth, you see. Uh, it's a very difficult problem. The best of these, to my knowledge, is the one I studied in South Africa, which was this truth and reconciliation thing. But even then, uh, and I happened to be there when the champion torturer was brought in, <laughs> and he hugged one of his victims, you know. <laughs> I, I, I tell you, I, I, I didn't want to laugh, but my God, it was the funniest damn thing I've ever seen. Um, and, and, and then, uh, uh, but the problem was that almost all of the major apartheid figures we never brought before the Truth and Reconciliation Tribunal. They just, <laughs> and then it turned out the ANC had been torturing its own guys over there, so Mandela gave him immunity from all the ANC guys. You see, so as it turned out, it was a fairly messy process. <laughs> you know, somehow or other they, they they managed to patch it together and and forget all the other stuff that they didn't want to remember anyway. You know, so but but what you raised is a very tricky and difficult and complex question. Okay. I think uh, one issue, maybe, uh, since I'm in the economic class in the air guard, you see, <laughs> maybe, maybe I can try to ask to see about some, something which was said, but there's the, the issue of democracy, if it exists at all, and time. Is this a key issue in many aspects? Of Machiavelli, for example, he was not exactly a theoretician of democracy, but he knew what was democracy because he, he addressed the question, and when he gives his solution to sum up very shortly, he said, yeah, we need a, a lasting state, uh, an état qui dure, for those who speak French in the room, an état qui dure, and an état qui dure, a lasting state for Machiavelli, is a combination to go out of the perpetual cycle, the theory of history of Polybus, as which I briefly mentioned this morning. You need to this cycle, for those who don't know, it's you know, you start with monarchy, and after you have tyranny, and after you have <coughs> aristocracy, and after it degenerates again in oligarchy, and after you have democracy, and after democracy you have democracy, it degenerates and with anarchy, and oh, you come back to see to the so to go out of this uh, cyclic history, which has a projection, very long-term projection of linear history, you know, because he had in mind the unity of, uh, uh, of Italy, it was his long-term foresight project. It was the first one before. What? He didn't talk technology. Yeah, but he knew a bit technology because he has written a, a wonderful book on art of war, yeah. uh, a very terrible subject, and which is excellent. So. And he proposed a way to see to combine to combine all the good 
with uh, uh, inverted commas, good forms of government, monarchy, aristocracy, and democracy, giving, in, not in the print, not in the prince, but uh, you know, his, his famous uh, speeches on, on uh, Titus Livius, I don't know Titus Livius in English, Tito Liv, uh, Tito Livio, and uh, he says it's a combination of monarchy, aristocracy, and democracy. So he was not democrat, but he combined democracy with the other <laughs> and, and for, for him, it's the, it's the key for, uh, and uh, that's the notion of a lasting state is very important, a lasting democracy. And because democracy is extremely fragile, Tocqueville underlined it very well in democracy in America, because uh, you're, you're, maybe the people are very happy with yes. stock bills, both the same in the beginning. But at the end of democracy in America, he makes one single gloomy two uh, foresight or prophecy, you know, the despotism, the soft despotism of the, what he called social democratic state, which is in fact the kind of description of the soft totalitarianism with a control pervading the whole society. And this is, of course, uh, uh, the fragility is there. So if we want to invent a new democracy, the, considering all the problems of, you see, of, the, uh, of managing the global issues and the national issues, and not opposing you know, this management of global issues and national sovereignty, we need, of course, to, to, to include time in democracy. But uh, the present forms of so-called democracy don't give you time. It's the tyranny of emergency, as I've written in many books or articles, tyranny of emergency, the, the cancellation of long-term vision of foresight. We need a in foresight democracy with a very long-term prospect. Of course, when there were some, some historic forms of, dem of democracy, very imperfect, but they, yet there was always a long-term vision. You see, always. And as General de Gaulle was saying, l'avenir dure longtemps, the future <laughs> lasts long. He, he made this word to Stalin when he met him during the Second World War. You know, that was when Stalin asked him to recognize the, the pro-Soviet, uh, Polish government exile in the Soviet Union, uh, de Gaulle uh, <laughs> refused to see politely and, and he, from end to this refusal, saying, l'avenir du long temps. Thank you. So thank you for, for your contributions, and I think you're back.